Uh, it takes a lot of work to put this together, and I would just like to do a few thank yous before we start. Fran Bergen is the forum producer and deserves a big round of applause. She's a great, done a great job. And we also have a fast, fantastic team at the forum. Stephanie, Shelley, Melissa, and Siobhan have all done a great job. And John and John are technicians. Thank you so much to you. Also, we've got a fantastic group of volunteers who work extremely hard for, for nothing but the love of cinema because they get to go to see films as a result. And thank you to you, the audience. Without you, obviously, we wouldn't be sitting here. Um, so we're very pleased to be ending today with a session called Success Stories. Uh, the, one of the things that's uh, particularly nice about these success, success stories is that they're Canadian success stories and the impact of their film has reached far beyond our own borders. Um, this session today is sponsored by City TV, and our speakers today are Ed Gast Donnelly and Jason Eisner. Ed Gast Donnelly has his roots in theater. He has a hands-on approach in, in that he is a writer, director, producer, and editor of his own films. He started with shorts and music videos, and then went on to the debut feature film called This Beautiful City, which premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival in 2007. He then went on to be nominated for four Genie Awards for that film. His next film stars Peter Stormar, Martha Plimpton, and Jill Hennessy. It's called Small Town Murder Songs. It premiered at the 2010 Toronto International Film Festival to great critical acclaim, and it culminated in Ed being named by Variety of one of its top ten directors to watch for 2011. Warm welcome for Ed, please. One of, these, one of the things about this session is that we're not, pro even though they, they both have beards, they're around the same age, <laughs> um, they, uh, one of the things that's completely different about them is the kind of films that they do. Jason Eisner, in 2007, made a fake trailer for, um, for a film that he wanted to make called Hobo with a Shotgun. It was in a competition for um, the film Grindhouse, and was selected by Robert Rodriguez, and was, wasn't it also Quentin Tarantino, mm -hmm. um, to win that competition. And he, um, it finally culminated in him making his first film, Hobo with a Shotgun. Um, in between, he also made a very interesting title film called Treevenge, which is a, um, details the experiences and horrifying realities of the lives of Christmas trees. <laughs> From that to Hobo with a Shotgun. <laughs> Um, now, to, to kick the session off, first we're going to show you um, the fake trailer uh, that, that Jason made. Um, if, is it possible to pull that one up? And maybe you can just set that up for us a little bit before we hit play. Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, Rob Rodriguez and Quint Tarantino, uh, when they got together to make Grindhouse, they put on a competition for filmmakers around the world to make a trailer to a fake exploitation movie. And so they only gave filmmakers like two weeks to go out shoot it, get it cut, make your own music, and then get it sent in. So uh, once we heard about the contest, we went out and we started shooting that night. We only had like 120 bucks. We shot it with like a DVX 100. And uh, the guy who plays the, the, the main hobo in the trailer had never acted a day before in his life. And this is the first time he ever had a camera in front of him. So what you see on the screen in this trailer is for real. It's his real anger. <laughs> <laughs> Spread the word, you dirty cocksuckers. Tell all your brave women and friends about the murder of the city. Yeah! Oh, oh, with a shotgun, the streets gave birth to a stray dog who is now fed up. Living on the streets is tough. It's about to get tougher. You want in on this $10? Come on! Violence, cruelty, murder. The streets will be lonelier because this hobo's taken off. He's cashing in his nickels and dimes for a new way of life. <laughs> but getting out isn't that easy. <laughs> this hero is going to have to deliver justice one shell at a time. Give me the fucking money! I can slit your goddamn throat! I'm gonna sleep in your bloody carcasses tonight! Shit, right now! Oh, with a 
shotgun. <laughs> well, that got the attention of Quentin Tarantino. Um, got my attention too. So, uh, a film like this. Now, what what was your background that led you up to this? I know that you've done some commercials before. Had you done yeah. commercials before this, or did this? No, no. Um, I guess the only experience I had before this has just been making movies with my friends in high school and community college when we got out of high school. Um, and so this was just like, I don't know, this was just like, there was like three of us working on this, like me, my producer, my best friend, my writer, John, and the guy who played Dave, and it was pretty much just like the four of us going out on the streets with a real shotgun, with no permits, <laughs> and just stealing every location. And, uh, and we shot it probably like in five days, just a couple of hours here and there, because it was just, it was a lot of... It was a lot of work to get Dave into that character, and because he'd never acted before, he just, he found it very frustrating because... Did you find Dave on the street? No, like, well, I was working at a comic book shop at the time, and Dave is one of these guys who would just wander into the shop every week and just tell me stories about his life, and uh, I just thought he was so entertaining and had a lot of character to him, and then he overheard that I was making, I was making movies with my friends, and he said, well, Jay, if you decide to make a movie someday, uh, keep me in mind. And I was like, all right, Dave, like, if I can figure out the right role, <laughs> we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> Boy, he must have been bummed when, when you chose Ritger Howard. No, he was very, he was very happy. Actually, like, we had planned on using, like, originally we wanted to use Dave as the hobo. And just the reality, when the reality sunk in on, like, how crazy and stressful it can be making a feature film, and like how fast you have to move. Um, like with that trailer, it was like at times there were like 30 takes to get a, like a good take from Dave. And I knew doing that on a feature, there's just no way you can do that. And it would just, it would make him very, it would just, it would be so hard on him. And so he, I, there was actually a point like before going into production where uh, he had like disappeared. He like totally was like avoiding the project. Like he was really terrified. He didn't, like, he was getting really scared about it, and so I, I ended up finding him on the set of another movie at the craft table, and uh, I just had like a good heart to heart with him, and I said, Dave, you know, if like you don't want to do this movie, like help me like find someone who could do it, and so I brought up Rugger Hauer because he was my favorite actor growing up, and Dave's eyes just like lit up. He was so excited, and uh, and when we made the feature film, I had Dave sit beside me at the monitor every single day and when he worked with Rugger, and most of the main inspiration for the character in the feature film came from Dave Brunt, the, the man, so. Wow, well he has a ton of energy on screen. I mean, yeah. I think he's, he's got great potential as actor. <laughs> excellent for talent spotting, very good. Um, and, in, uh, and also in terms of um, setting up for this film, like you said that you worked together with your friends in high school. It's like, had you been making a lot of stuff together? Or oh what yeah. Kind of, what kind of things were you making? Um, I, like, I guess when we started, when we first picked up a camera, our first love, I think, was like martial arts films, and so we were just, we put ourselves in them, we knew nothing about martial arts, but we just like tried to make these like really ridiculous martial arts movies. And we just made like every weekend in school, like I remember in high school when I like, I think I was in grade 11 where I was so, I got so obsessed with it, that we just forgot about like going to parties or anything, we just like spent every weekend and every day after class just making movies. Right, so you're the film nerds. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, that paid off, didn't it? <laughs> but also, too, like, I think, like, the reason I first picked up a camera was I, like, I used to be really into skateboarding. And mm -hmm. so I saved up money to buy a camera so I could film me and my friends skateboarding. And uh, I've, I am also an editor as well, too. I've always edited everything we've done. I've edited our, edited our feature. And a lot of, like, where I, like, I take from those days of growing up shooting skateboard videos and then I apply it into my work today is, like, it really taught me like how to like look at locations like when, uh, when you're going skateboarding and you want to get like a good shot of someone doing a trick 
you like really study the location or just look at a location as a potential for like what can you do with the location and so I found that coming back a lot to me while making Hobo is just going to the location and starting to like dream up the action like on the location and what we could do with like the sets or the, the so locations you, that were there. So can you be more specific like for instance when you talk to us about one of the locations that you went to and what was the surprise at that location that was a bonus? Um, I think like in Hobo like there's this big finale and uh, we were trying to find a location that, that could work and and we were having a lot of time, like a lot of tough time, trying to find the right place. And we, I, we just found this. Uh, it was like an abandoned sail asylum, and then behind it there was like a little alleyway. And it wasn't originally like what we had in mind for the ending, but there was a couple things there that had really cool potential. And so we, we what? saw it like a couple weeks beforehand. Just like there was like a manhole, like a, a manhole in the ground there. And so in the end, you see like Rugger gets put up to his like neck in this like manhole, and just by like finding this like. This, uh, this like location, we just instantly just started adapting to it and, and rewriting the script to work with the location. Right. Um, just talk briefly about how you work on script because um, you directed this, um, but you said that you've also been working with a friend for a long time. Who's mm -hmm. your friend and how do you work with um, Yeah, uh, uh, who I collaborate with is uh, my best friend, John Davies, and I've been friends with him since we were five years old. And so we've grown up and discovered our love for filmmaking together. And usually, like, how we work is we'll lock ourselves up in, in like a cabin or like in one of our apartments and we'll or we'll go to Ronnie's pizza pizza shop that's like this like pizza joint that we go to pitch ideas back and forth and we just like we just pull out paper and we just start coming up with ideas and then when we're writing the script I'm just right there with him while he's writing and uh, and then he'll give me drafts and then I'll just make notes on it and we'll just keep going back and forth with it so you're technically co-writers on the script yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I give him more of the credit, though. Like he, he's he spends most of the time like in front of the computer doing yeah. it. Yeah. Right, cool. Um, so now, Ed, what about you in terms of um, your your process? So you're uh, just in, with background. Your father is Ken Gass, who's um, got the Factory Theater in Toronto. So you're very steeped in a theater tradition, from theater to film. Like, what was the transition for you? Um, I mean, I was doing theater a lot from a pretty young age, and. And it was just sort of a, I got to a point where like I, I wasn't getting funding for a project I wanted to do and, um, and I didn't want to do something for the sake of it. So I was just kind of like floundering for a year and my girlfriend at the time, who was an actor, just kept encouraging me to go into film. But, you know, for me, I, I, and it's funny because I mean, because we're five years age in difference and it was like just in that, within that time is like for me the difference like when the Canon XL1 came out and that like changed yeah. what you sort of felt was possible. <laughs> so I definitely sort of grew up where it still seemed like an entirely technical medium so I didn't, like I, I had no idea how you'd go about it because again like there wasn't quite that functional di digital breakthrough yet and she, I just ended up you know sort of calling a, a sort of family friend who's a TV producer and I ended up just working as a director's assistant on, on an MOW and it just sort of like demystified the process and uh, and then, yeah, within the next year, you know, I just sort of I made three shorts and just kind of, and, and it was actually, yeah, the next year the Canon actual one came out. And then suddenly, I, well, we shot my first one on 35, but like suddenly once the tools became more accessible, like things seemed more possible. And, you know, I just started making a bunch of shorts and then music videos and, and then features. So then when you, um, I'm presumably one of the big advantages you had is that you had access to a really great acting pool because of your, you know, being in that family, being in a big theater family there. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, I think the biggest thing is like, yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, if anybody's here, runs, runs a film school, they'll be mad at me. But I, I generally say, like, you know, screw film school, like, you go make a movie. And, and especially, I mean, or I say, like, go like, make a pl do a play. And that's some logic, because at least one thing that theater affords you that, that often, like, especially short films don't, is, like, time to, like, fail with actors. Like, like you, you need to make mistakes and, like, and often, but if you only got, like, a day to shoot something and you're, and you're, you're figuring, you can't figure it out, like, you know, you're kind of stuck. But I think, like, that's the one thing in theater. And is even though it's an entirely different acting style and a different process, fundamentally, you really learn how to, how to uh, communicate with, uh, with an actor and really try and like, nurture and, and understand and fully understand their process. Like, it's not just like, I need you to like, cry and have your lip quiver like, just like that. I mean, it's like, you know, like, you can't <laughs> give those, or yeah, I guess you can, but I mean, you'll get selective results. But uh, really trying to understand like, what their process is and how to best help them get to where you want them to go and to, and to create like, a real dialogue. And I think, uh, in an ideal world in film, you've got, you know, tons of time and um, you can do that. But I just think from a practical point of view, I, th I, I found that to be, like, the most useful advantage that I had. And um, Had you been an actor yourself as well? I, I wanted to. I was a bad actor. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, there's a lot to be learned from mistakes as well. Um, okay, so then take us from uh, when you made your, your, you said you were doing music videos and shorts, and um, what led you to your first feature from there? What was the breakthrough point? That was loosely based on a play. Like, I hadn't done a play for a few years, and then I'd had one idea that I'd written when I was like 21 and, and sat on it for like four or five years and, and sort of dug it up again. And then it was, it was, a, it was a neat person because it was the first time I'd ever written anything from that long ago or gone, revisited something and had, had such a sense of uh, uh, objectivity. And I was like, oh, there's all these really great things that I was playing with then and all this stuff that was just pure crap. And, uh, and then started just adapting that, did it as a play. And then we felt. Just really, uh, just from the character point of view, we just felt there was something really um, exciting there that we should make as a movie. And so I just started adapting, you know, that was in 2004, and then just started adapting that idea. And, and then in 2006, we, you know, uh, sort of met with one of my, my, one of my best friends from high, well, he wasn't my best friend at the time in high school, but we went to high school together and did several plays together. Aaron Poole, who was the lead in This Beautiful City. Um, you know, he introduced me to just a friend of his, Who's a poker player and sort of and banker, uh, and basically we sort of like made a pact where we were like we are a train with no breaks, and come October 16th we're shooting whether we've got like half a million bucks or like 50,000 bucks. And uh, so sorry, just to clarify, this poker player was a banker and was going to raise. He was a former banker. Who, he, he's hilarious. <laughs> no, he's hilarious. I mean, like you know, he is. He's a cliche. Like so. He, was, I mean, did he become producer or he was? A yeah, yeah, he's a producer. He's, he's, I mean, he, and he produced Small Town as well. He's as Lee Kim. But it was just you know, he was like a banker who was unhappy being a banker and like, um, you know, put out the most cliche. I mean, this was a very good tip. Anybody, any yeah. poker players in the crowd, if you're not playing poker, get in the game. <laughs> like he's the most like cliche Korean. Like he has like this <laughs> horrible synth pop album that he put out. Like like he is like he did all these things that he admits is like a complete cliche, and he followed like. But uh, like he just he put out an album. He wrote a play. Like he was just trying. To, ultimately, he wasn't happy being a banker, even though he was making a ton of money, and was trying to find an outlet for artistic expression and. Uh, when we started working on that, um, you know, uh, you know, I mean, and, he's, and he's producing quite a bit now. So I mean, but that ended up being, I think, the you know, a, you know, a combination of, of his skills where you could well, actually have sort of you know business and art mixed and together. And a great deal of serendipity on your part and staggering costs as poker partner. So yeah, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not like the guy like you know could just like turn a tap and CIBC would run it. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like I'm still you know b by the pact we made, it was like you know he and I agreed to personally. Borrow like a hundred grand to make that movie as well. Mm -hmm. So, of which I'm still paying off part of that. But, um, but again, like I, you know, for me, like the fifty grand that like I personally spent on that movie is again like I, it was way more useful than any, you know, uh, you know, sorry, any again from a film school. But like then I, and I got more out of that than I would have any film school. I really think, and largely as well because just from a, from a business perspective, by actually making a film that you know premieres at the right festivals, that it opened me up to telefilm, which all the development money and future financing was all like by Doing that, like it actually direct, there was a direct correlation mm. to you know future funds and access and blah blah blah. So, even though yeah, I lost fifty grand making that. I mean, it was by far a worthwhile investment. Okay, so then moving from there to Small Town Murder Songs, um, because you, I mean, you did have success with your first film, also at the Toronto Film Festival, amongst other places. How the transition to the second film was that a lot smoother for you? Um, yeah, but I mean, I know I, I've I've been blessed by ignorance because if I like, uh, I just. Honestly, I mean, I mean, like if I actually knew what I was doing, I, I, I probably wouldn't have tried. I mean, in some ways, because I just sort of assumed blindly that we'd get money, and we did. But if I actually knew what the competition was, I wouldn't have been anywhere near as cocky as to like start spending again, borrowing money and going out of pocket. But um, you did that as well on Small Town Murder Song. Just yeah, I mean, I started funding the development because I was certain we'd get the money. But I, I actually thought there was a lot more money available than there was. And when I found out like how little but, money. But when you say funding the development, I mean. Y as the writer director, no, like hiring casting director, okay. committing to like okay. offers on actors, like wow. all, so um, you know, not huge amounts of money, but like you know, tens of thousands of dollars that I, I certainly couldn't afford to, that, you know, it was I credit guarded it, but um, uh, but yeah, and then you know, it was just a quick process where I started writing that movie in January, and, you know, and by June we went in and got money, and and then it just we were shooting again by October, so I'm very much like I try and. I don't like waiting, uh, and uh, I, I really try and create a culture of like actually making, you know, by saying it's happening, it, it makes people believe it's happening a bit more, okay. and uh, and also just sometimes being willing to, you know, take the chance to actually, you know, lose it. You know, if I, you know, I knew going in that if we didn't get the money, I'd be out the money I'm spending. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that said, you know, on, on this beautiful city, we did have Lee play. We all put in some money and had Lee play go play poker actually in Vancouver, 
um, to raise development money. Uh, <laughs> and did it work? It did, yeah. <laughs> Although, there was one day where he was like, like, I've lost it all, and plus you owe me two grand. <laughs> but there was... <laughs> he, 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 uh, he, he managed to find a swing, and, uh, yeah. So does that mean that um, you, your film expands and contracts in terms of, you know, the production... You will adapt... You know, based on how bad our gambling habits are? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, 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 but, like, if, if with Small Town Murder Songs, what was the original budget that you were aiming for, and what did you end up with? Um... It's pretty close. I mean, I think we went for like 1.5 million, and we ended up with 1.4. So I mean, it was close to um, like you know, there's a you know, there's, there's a couple of funds that have never given me money. Uh, that which ones? I think with the opportunity <laughs> to shame. Actually, yeah, yeah, I'll shame them. No, I mean, whatever. <laughs> now they knew who they are. Um, but so we thought we'd at least get one of them, and they all said no except for Telefilm. So. And did, what did they say no? Like, what was it that they objected to, or, or did? Well, you I don't know. I, I just get like a form letter. So, uh, and it wasn't the most uh, dialogue based. I know. I was just like, okay, fine. Like, I didn't even want to. Like, I know. Like, it's like they just made a decision. Like, there's nothing to be done at that point. I didn't right. really. I honestly, I didn't really care because it's not like they're going to reverse their decision if I change something. So. Actually, that's not entirely true. But either way. All right. Next time you'll, you'll <laughs> go back to them again. Well, when you're shooting, in, when you start shooting in four weeks, it's like yeah. yeah you just figure out, okay, what do I do now? Right. Um, again, because like in this beautiful city, you know, we managed to conv convince a distributor to pre-buy the film, um, which again, I'm shocked that we were able to do. Um, which just distributor took on this beautiful city? Uh, Seville, which is now E1. Right. Which again, for such a small movie, I mean, to John Hamilton's his credit of stupidity, because I mean, the movie didn't make money, but he was talking about being a champion of like, of an artist though. I mean, like he, they came on for, you know, for a quarter million dollar movie that get with a quarter of our budget. And that's um, based on the script and having seen your short film? Yeah. So I mean, that's like, that was a huge risk. Um, and, and, uh, and just, but you know, he believed in us and, uh, and you know, creatively, they were very happy with it. It's just, you know, it is sometimes very hard to take a small, gritty, violent, you know, movie and uh, release it in, in, in the marketplace. So, um, you know, I think everybody was, you know, you know certainly kudos to, to him for doing that. I mean, obviously, if you keep doing that, you're not going to have a business. But it's a, but that's the trick. It's like, how do you know, how do you, you know, the art and commerce balance is a constant struggle. Right. Um, well, let's take a look at mm -hmm. um, the uh, trailer for your film, Small Town Murder Songs. <clears throat> yeah. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's the, that's the entire trailer, actually. <laughs> I told you, we didn't have that extra 100000 or it would have made a difference, but... Uh, <laughs> all I could afford was those laurels. Uh, yeah, shoot that one. I think it's the same one. Oh, but look, it's loaded. you can see the loading bar is now actually working. Yeah, I was distressed. I 
paint like I want. Walter, you can't change who you are. But you can choose to act against your differences. Can we turn up the volume? I don't want to see you no more, you hear? And you sure can't touch this case. You're done. Walter! So obviously one of the things with something like this is it's, this is really, really cast dependent um, for this film. And uh, Jill Hennessy and Peter Storm are, are I, I mean, I think this is one of the best things I've ever seen Jill Hennessy in. And Peter Stormar is just such a fantastic character actor. Can you talk a little bit about how you got <laughs> that level of talent in your, in your second feature? Yeah, well, it certainly wasn't because of, of, of money. Um, but, because, uh, you know, both of those guys, you know, came out you know, for, for, for very little money. But, you know, it just, I think sometimes, you know, I think material is, is, is kind of the biggest strength you have. Like, I would... I, I find it would just be such a hard position to be in, like, being a filmmaker who didn't also write. Like, if I was just looking to get hired or just trying to find scripts, that would be such a, a brutal process, I think. But, like, the, you know, the power you have is when you ge can generate your own material. So, and especially, I, I think there's something for me really interesting about um, casting people against type and offering them roles. I think it's just, A, just much richer just from a creative perspective, but also gives you, I think, a better chance to actually get them to do something. And so, I mean, Peter... Well, he makes a lot of money working on huge Hollywood movies. You know, usually has like the bad guy. Um, in case you don't recognize him with the mustache, I mean, that's the guy who put Steve Buscemi in the Wood Chipper in Fargo, and it's like an Armageddon and Bad Boys Two, and he's now co-starring in a big Schwarzenegger movie. And so he's done like you know huge, huge films. And um, but uh, you know, I I, th I think. He just, you know, he, he'd always been playing, you know, the support or the comic relief or the villain, and and there was just I'd seen, been watching the TV show Prison Break. And I'd been working with a New York-based casting director, and we were jamming on ideas, and, and she'd mentioned him, and then Armageddon happened to be on TV, and I saw him, and I, was, and I thought he was so funny in that, and I'd forgotten he was in that, and then I started looking at more of his work, and it was for me, it was when I saw Dancer in the Dark, which he's in, and that was what really sold me on him, because there was just such a, a gentleness and an innocence to that, to his role in that film, like he plays the, the, the factory worker who's sort of in love with Bjork, and, and it just, it felt like entirely different for me than the villains or the comic relief I'd seen him play before. So I, just, I got excited that there was more to him than just what I'd, the, the certain level of what I'd been seeing. So, yeah, I mean, basically just flew to New York, got drunk with him and shook hands, and that was it. Um, and I think I lost the drinking match because he's like 6'4 in Swedish, so. <laughs> <laughs> and he can drink like red wine and then vodka, like right. alternate, alternating. And he's terrible <laughs> tasting red wine. <laughs> um, and Martha Plimpton? It's funny, Martha was the first person I thought of for that role, but then, you know, sometimes you walk the path of, le the path of least resistance, and man, I'm actually now blanking on her name, she, won an, she was nominated for an Oscar, sweet, another Swedish actress, and it was just a coincidence, because Peter knows her, and I think they, they worked together on something, I'm completely blanking on her name, uh, yeah, but anyway, so, it, you know, he was like, you know, because of that personal connection with them, I was thinking, like, okay, she'd actually be great, and that looked like that was going to happen, and then fell apart at the last minute, and then I ended up getting Martha. So it was this one thing that I ended up circuitously getting the, the first person that we wanted. And it was just, you know, making an offer. And she just, you know, she'd been doing a lot of theater. Uh, you know, she just, like, had, like, her fourth, I think, Tony nomination that year. But so she was just happy to, but she'd been doing TV and, and theater a lot. So I think she was happy to do a movie. Um, and it just was the timing worked out. And Jill Hennessy, because, I mean, one of the things is you're Canadian, obviously, one of, in terms of triggering some financing, you need to have some Canadian stars in it. Jill Hel Hennessy is mainly known for her work on Law and & Order, and, um, but she's been in a lot of other things. Um, was that an easy get as well? Well, you know, it's funny. I actually didn't know Jill was Canadian. Um, I was at the film festival, like, you know, I guess a month and a half before we were starting to shoot, and um, a friend of mine, Ryan, we were just, I was at a party, and I was just saying, like, yeah, I mean, I need to figure out who this... Because you need, it's like the, in order to be sort of CanCon, the, the second highest paid actor has to be Canadian. So either that means like me bumping up, 
you know, Aaron or something like figuring out, depending, but you know, tr you know, but also you're trying to put as many sort of recognizable faces in a movie just from a business perspective as possible. Um, and he was like, well, what about Jill Hennessy? And I was like, is she, oh, she's Canadian? I didn't know. And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm actually close friends with her. So he texted Jill on the spot and was just like, oh, there's this great filmmaker, you got to check him out. And then, you know, we just followed up from a business perspective and sent her the, uh, you know, sent her my first film, which she really liked, sent her the script. And it, it actually, you know, we just spoke on the phone and that was kind of, it was that, I don't want to say it's always that easy, but that would just worked out like it was just a perfect, yeah. Right. And then in terms of the, um, the investors for, um, uh, for your second film, did, you, did they have certain um, casts that they had in mind or were there any pressures on you? In terms well, of I mean, the, the biggest pressure was because, because I don't like to wait, uh, was like the, the Bond company was like, a Bond's never been closed this fast. And like they were, uh, you know. Who was your Bond company? Oh, I can't remember now. I, um, but I mean, it, it, was, it was tricky, you know, because again, like, you know, my producing partner, you know, it was, it was Lee and I producing it, and so Lee's not even on set for the first two and a half weeks because he's trying to, he's in Toronto trying to close the bond. And uh, but uh, uh, the biggest problem was because I wanted to shoot, but I didn't have a cast yet, and of course we had TV pre-sales, or we're trying to lock a TV pre-sale, but it's that's going to be. We had negotiated different purchase prices based on cash. It was like, it was, if it just, so that was because I was trying to like get, so I was trying to strategically position things so that they're like, well, you can't close until you have this. I'm like, well, what if we hypothetically agree to a list of 20 actresses and if we get one of those in the second role, you'll give us this much money. And that, that was what our contract was. It was sort of this, yeah, it was sort of contingent, contingent on, these, on these extra steps. So it could at least close the paperwork enough to move on to the next level. Mm -hmm. so, so that was my idea of just trying to figure out, okay, what can I do to, I don't want to wait, so how can we, so this is on about a one, you said 1.4, 1 1.5 yeah. million dollar budget. And who were your key investors in the film? In Telefilm. Was, I mean, Telefilm and then TV pre-sales. It was TMN and Movie Central bought it. Right. And so if Telefilm came in and, and TV pre-sales, does that mean you did not have a distributor on board going in? Correct. I mean, we, or sorry, we did, but we, we had a deal where, because we also didn't want to, you know, the, the deal was, say, like when it was Seville, you won, they also handled international sales, and we wanted to hold that back. So, um, sorry, we, you wanted to hold back Canada. No, sorry. Uh, for this, we wanted to hold. We didn't want to give. Away, we didn't want to go with the distributor where we would be giving up our international pre-sales yet, because we wanted to finish the film and actually we felt that we could do better that way. Um, but uh, well, I mean, who knows you know, whether that was the case or not? But um, so Kino Smith, you know, who had just I think yeah. been, you know, um, was just sort of been approved to sort of be a uh, like a pre-approved distributor with Telefilm. So I think we were their first film through going through that fund and, or through that way. Um, so they were our official. Distributor. So, we, but again, you know, we, we didn't ask them for any money, but that also bought us certain creative freedoms. Within. So then you did have uh, um, Kino Smith on as your distributor, and the TV sales, that, the advanced TV sales that you made were not part of your budget. That went against your um, Canadian distribution advance. Well, no, we didn't ask them for an advance, so that was part of the deals. We kept gotcha. our own okay. pre-sales, right. but it also just meant we had to cash flow our pre-sales. Okay, and then so that uh, you held back international, and then international was something that you went out to after Correct, the, yeah, the and, and, and we're still in the midst of, you know, and our sales agent is still... Who's your sales agent? It's a visit Films out of New York. Okay, great. Um, so then let's now take a quick look at um, uh, Jason's uh, final trailer for Hobo with a Shotgun, the um, Rutger Hauer version. Cool. Um, bar at the top on the right hand side, the little circle. There you go. I, I used to be like you. Long time. Now, right now, perfect. Those days, no regret. People look at you and think of how wonderful your future will be. I want you to be something special, like a doctor. Oh, yeah. I hate to tell you this, but if you grow up here, you're 
So um, from $120 for the trailer number one mm -hmm. to, um, what was the budget of the final film? It was uh, $3 million. $3 million on trailer number two. So um, that's, uh, that's a big journey. And it's interesting to, to actually um, watch the trailers almost back to back because you see all of the roots of what you finally did. I mean, you yeah. obviously, this was all preconceived in your head. You, you knew the film mm -hmm. before, you, but, but you hadn't actually written the entire film yet, had you? When you did the fake trailer? Had you written No, that? no. When we made that fake trailer, we basically, like I said, we kind of like, when we heard about the contest, we went out and we started shooting that night. And so we pretty much just like got together and kind of came up with like a little treatment as to what we thought the whole story would be and then kind of picked out the best moments that we thought would be really cool for the trailer. That is just such a great example of how to, you know, go out and pitch a feature film. And it's yeah. shocking that you managed it. You pulled that all together in five days. It's amazing. Yeah, like, what, I guess, like, the big help was when we put that original trailer online, it just blew up. It got, like, it, it was, there was, like, a couple million views, and people just started demanding was that Was that we, on through the website, through the Grindhouse? No, just we put it up on YouTube on my account. It was, like, one of the first videos I put up on YouTube, and it just took off. Like, websites just started, like spreading it around and so when we went to our distributor uh they just they saw like the potential and that there was already an audience for it and they were they were actually the ones who brought it up to us do you want to make a feature film out of this you know this this actually brings up a very interesting point because one of the things there there are a few companies now that are starting up a um internet uh you know internet crowdsourcing has been going on for for a while <coughs> but another thing that um companies are doing is they are going to filmmakers and say make a trailer we'll take it we'll show it around and depending on the um the feedback from the audience we'll then take it and shop it in hollywood for you and raise the financing for you mm -hmm. so you did this without that system in place Mm -hmm. You did this yourself, and then entered the um, and also the Grindhouse competition. Yeah. Talk, um, explain to us how, how it went after with the Grindhouse competition. You got a call from them. Then what happened? Um, well, yeah, basically, like when, when we won the contest, uh, we were invited to go to the Grindhouse premiere in L.A. Who called you? Uh, it was uh, Quentin's executive producer, yeah. and so uh, we we were invited, and so we, me and my producer went. And uh, he had never been to Universal Studios, so I decided to like take him one day, like the day after the screening. And once we get up to the gate, I get this phone call from Toronto, and it's uh, Alliance. And uh, they said they loved the trailer. They wanted to take, they took our that hundred and twenty dollar trailer and blew it up to like two hundred film prints and actually released it with Grindhouse in Canada. And they said, well, we're also interested in turning this into a feature film. Would you want to come up to Toronto and meet a producer? And so. We went up to Toronto and met a producer by the name of Nee Fitchman from Rhombus, and we just hit it off and started developing the movie. So they saw it, they approached Neve, they brought Neve, brought you and Neve together, and you went from there. Yeah. And was Neve the driving producer on the film? He, he's like, he, well, he, he raised all the money for us. Right. Yeah. And, and, and was he involved creatively? Because this is so... Oh, Neve yeah. Fishman produced um, The Red Violin, and, you know, that's, that's really the kind of film that Neve Fishman produced. Yeah. So... Yeah, well... <laughs> Um, I mean, from the sublime he, to the ridiculous. He, I don't know. I think there was just like, um, 
a part of him that just kind of wanted to like <laughs> let loose and get crazy. And so we like gave him the script. He just he would uh, he would bring ideas too. Like we just totally left it open for anyone to bring ideas to the table. And so he just opened up his sick mind and would pitch us ideas and <laughs> work some of them in there. And <laughs> yeah. right. What was his sickest idea? Oh man. <laughs> um, I don't, I guess, well, there's this moment, it's, it's not that sick, really, but there's just like this moment where an octopus shows up in the movie. <laughs> just <laughs> random? It's, yeah, this like random octopus. And he's def that was definitely one of like his ideas. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so next time you think of Neve Fishman and Red Violin, think of the octopus. Um, okay, so then, uh, um, so you made the film and Rutger Hauer was in the film. How many yeah. days did you have to shoot it? Um, we had, uh, I think it was, we had 24 days of like principal photography and then we also just ran out with the T2I with a couple friends and we just went out for I think like two days after what, that. What's the T2I? Oh, the Canon T2I. It's like a $700 uh, SLR camera. So did you shoot the whole thing on digital? Yeah, we shot it with the red camera with the Mysterium X chip. But then we, for like our C camera, we used this like $700 Canon camera that was great. And so when we finished the film, we still had a bunch of like little pickups and things that we wanted to shoot. So we just got like our our crew together and just went out and grabbed a bunch of crazy stuff. So the, you said you had a C camera, so you had an A camera, a B camera, and yeah. a C camera. Mm -hmm. And um, then you had three DPs on set? No, three I just... Three camera operators? Um, yeah, I, like, well, we had uh, Kareem Hussein, who was my DP, but also, like, a camera operator, and Jeff Wheaton, who is my DP on a, a short, the, the short I did called Treevenge, and he worked B camera. And together, they worked together, and then... Uh, the guy who was shooting the, the making of documentary, he was another one of my best friends. Uh, I would just get him to pop his camera down whenever we thought we might need a third angle. So now this is one of the things that um, I know that you did on your film and that's something that we've been talking about on and off over the last five days is about, okay, so you make a film and the way people now see films is they see them on a, an iPhone, they see them on an iPad, they, mm -hmm. um, it sounds like an ad for Apple, they see them on an Apple computer. <laughs> and they, you know, they see them um, in a theater, they see them anywhere, anywhere they want to see them now. Um, so, uh, but the other thing is that in order to get the word out, there are traditional forms of advertising and things have changed dramatically now. Um, I know that one of the things for you is because you actually, you launched with this trailer online, um, you had a different way of staying in contact with your audience. Can you talk a little bit about your philosophy about that and what you did? Yeah, I guess, um, because I, I wouldn't have made the feature film if it weren't for the online support that we had and people just demanding that we make the film. So I thought it was really important to like make this film for them, and so I tried to keep them. Uh, I tried to bring them along for the whole journey. So while we were doing the production, uh, going into prep and shooting, me and Rugger would just shoot little videos like all the time, just kind of explaining what we're doing and just trying to keep people involved and keep the, just make the the online audience feel like they are a part of making the movie because they it, it just it wouldn't have happened without them. So, so we little just, daily interviews. On yeah, set? yeah, yeah, hmm. and just like just little weird shorts and stuff too that we would do like on lunch breaks and <laughs> and so it's a uh, yeah it was a lot of fun and people really <coughs> like really dug it and uh, really so you're making it a feature film it. and you break for lunch instead of eating lunch you make a short film for the internet. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. <laughs> Whoa. Um, and so then uh, once you once you completed the feature what happened with it then? Um, well, as soon as we finished shooting, I had to go right into editing because we wanted to try and make a Sundance deadline. And, well, first we wanted to make the deadline of submitting it. And uh, I, we worked like nonstop, me and my producer. I just went to his home and I lived in his basement. Even though I only lived like 15 minutes away, I just needed to like get myself locked up in a place and just have my mind like 100% like on the movie. And so we were working like seven days a week from like 10 in the morning. We'd start editing till probably like five in the morning. And we did that for a couple months. And then we so, ended so up- who, who was in the room? You? Just me and my producer most of the time. And then sometimes my, the writer, John Davies, would come over and, and help out as well too. So you're, you're, at, you're operating the edit, edit equipment yourself yeah. the entire yeah. time, right? And non, neither of them are editing as well? I no, mean, I didn't even not, like, have like an assistant editor helping me, which is kind of a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> just so, but, but I'm curious about that. Like, it's a three million dollar feature film. Why would you? Why would you not have more support in post production? Um, well, we did. Like, once I finished the cut, like we've got like you know, we took it to Technicolor and Tattersall who did the, the, the yeah. sound. But um, I don't know. I guess like I've always cut everything that we've done, and um, I'm 
I don't know. Like, I am trying to find another editor because I don't want to go through that process again. But uh, I just wanted to be—I wanted it to be as like perfect as possible, and I wanted to see every single frame that I shot, so that I knew I could learn from my mistakes. And so I watched everything. I've seen every frame of this movie like a million times in all the other shots. And so it like really taught me, like, when maybe I should move on from like doing, you know, maybe take three was like usually my take threes are better than, you know, take nine or whatever. And know when to move on and when I should probably go for coverage instead of like staying on a take. Right. So I learned a lot through just like cutting the film myself. Right. But uh, I don't think I'll, I don't know. I say I don't think I'll do it again, but who knows. Yeah, but if you've got time to do something at lunch, I like that. Yeah. Um, so then uh, um, it, you said Alliance Atlantis um, with the Grindhouse released the um, fake trailer. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have the completed film and you make your real trailer. What happens with it then? Who, who's your distributor? In, the, in uh, Canada, it was Alliance, and in the States, it was uh, Magnet. They're off of okay. Magnolia. Yeah. Um, and did you have an international sales agent attached to yeah, yourself? Yeah, uh, TF1. TF1, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and it just we we played we premiered at Sundance and then played this year. yeah and then played South by Southwest right after. And in and Sundance, then, you launched the midnight section there. Yeah. Right. And uh, how did that go? It was amazing. It was such an incredible experience. Uh, we like I had been there a couple like two years before that with my short film Treevenge, and so I kind of knew what to expect. Like I first kind of thought Sundance. Like I, I never in my mind thought that they would be into the kind of films that we were making. But we played our short film there at the Egyptian theater with a movie called Dead Snow. And I remember coming out of the theater. And that was in the midnight section too? Yeah. yeah. I remember coming out of the theater and seeing like a pool of blood on the ground. And I was like, what? I asked the guy selling the tickets, I was like, what the hell happened out here? He's just like, oh man. When they sold it at tickets to this screening, people just started throwing <laughs> chairs and bottles. It got crazy out here. And so, like, the audience out there is, like... They did, is that true? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, it, it, like, the audience out there is crazy. And I, I love it. I so kinda... what explains the blood? Oh, someone got smashed in the head with a chair. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> That's amazing. Seems like something you put into your next film. It felt like home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now what's happened with the film since then? Um, it had an amazing uh, Canadian and uh, states theatrical run. It's uh, played in the UK. How much did you make in Canada? In Canada, I think we played on like, I think it was uh, like 50 screens. And I think uh, in our first two weeks we made, I think it was like 600,000. Right. Yeah. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, and then uh, in terms of international, has it shown at other film festivals internationally? Yeah, it's played at like uh, Fright Fest. It's playing in Spain and Sitges next week. Um, to which you're going? Yeah. To Sitges, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's played festivals in France, Australia, um, Korea. Uh, it's been all mm -hmm. over the place. It's opening in Japan in November. Right. Um, so it's been, it's been doing great, and our DVD sales have been amazing as well, too. So what's happened to you personally in terms of um, now that you've had a big success and you've made a, a big splash and there's been lots of sensation around it, um, what's happened to you in terms of your ability to finance future films? Um, so far, it's pretty good. Like, because Hobo did so well and uh, through, uh, through Telefilm, uh, basically, there's like an, uh, an open envelope system that Telefilm have. If you make a film that's like successful in the theater, uh, you get like a certain amount of uh, Telefilm's money in their next, their next round of funding that you get allocated to yourself. And so we, goes uh, we to have you or to your producer? Uh, it go, well, it goes to our producer who's, in, who's producing our next work. Right. Yeah. Right. So we've opened up the door to, to get our next film produced. Um, okay, and so then now um, over to you, Ed. In your case, uh, you were named by Variety as one of the top ten to direct directors to watch for 2011. That's um, not just Canadian directors, that's international directors. It's a, it's a massive, massive coup. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, to me, I think that's the kind of thing that suddenly the eyes of the world are on, on you in terms of people who are interested in, in finding new talent. Um, the, the tone of um, small town murder songs is, um, your, your films are clearly totally very, very <laughs> different. Um, the um, small town murder songs is, is something that is um, 
uh, even though that obviously there's there is a mystery to it and something that happens in it and um, it really focuses very much on the character the the individual characters and what happens to them and their relationships and uh, um, Peter Stormer I think um, it, I mean all of the, the the actors in your film I think are great but Peter Stormer really really carries the film in terms of the emotional jur journey that the audience connects to through that so has that affected the kind of because you now have an agent um, in, who's your agent, agency? Uh, ICM. ICM. So um, they, they approached you, how did that all... Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's funny, like, this was like, it was such a slow burn, this movie, like, we premiered in Toronto, but, I mean, we got kind of buried, like, no press really came out while we were at the festival, and then, like, we got this, like, insane review in Variety, but it came out, like, I don't know, like, the day after the festival, so it was like, and then, so you're, you're like, but everybody's gone home by then, so it was like, and then the other reviews started coming out, and... And, you know, it was just this funny, weird coincidence of, like, I went to this small festival in North Carolina, that I, and I only went there because I loved their graphic design. <laughs> like, it's called Kukaloris, and, like, I loved the design. Like, they had one of my shorts had played there, and they invited me to come, and I was like, well, they just seem like, you know, I basically was like, because I'm a, a graphic designer as well, I was like, they look like they'd be fun people, because I like the aesthetic of their design. So I went, and on the most cutest route, I somehow got them to fly me for free to, via L.A., even though, like, North Carolina is nowhere near L.A., but... And it was this one sort of thing, because I went there and ended up hanging out with this one guy who I'll come back to in a minute, but it was just this thing where I, so I ended up going to L.A. and having lunch with Steve Gatos from Variety, who was a huge fan of, of my first film, even though, like, Variety, the critic there had panned it. Um, so it was just this funny thing. We were just talking about, like, you know, the release strategy for the film, what we were doing, and how we'd gotten this great review in Variety, and he hadn't seen the movie yet, but he, he just sort of was like, oh, I want to suggest you maybe for this thing. And uh, I thought he was going to do, like, an article on, like, alternative distribution strategies or something. And then, you know, we went to, um, to, tr to our European premiere in Torino in Italy. And, you know, we, the day I got back from that, like, my phone was just, like, had all these messages. And it was this funny thing. I was actually disappointed to find out about the variety thing because I thought that meant we'd made this, like, huge fucking sale. <laughs> I was like, I'm rich! And because uh, I've got, like, my sales agent, my publicist, like, all these people calling me. And I'm like... That me, you know. So, but it was like, oh, I'm on the list. Like, is there a check? Like, um, um, but you know, and then it just became like thing from that. And then eventually, uh, one of the guys that again I met in Kukaloris runs this cool theater in Brooklyn, and booked the movie there because of having met me there. And then like that was the one that really, you know, that was then like, you know, we got we got on the variety list. That ended up getting me like an agent, manager, and lawyer, and a bunch of cool stuff was happening. But uh, it was like once we played New York, and then like you know, critically, it just like lit up. Like like we just got like you know like New York Times critics picked like Wall Street Journal, like all the major press were just like raving. So then just suddenly, but like that's like you know by that point, you know what nine months after its premiere is when the heat was really starting to like culminate. So it was just it was it was a very slow but constantly you know building process. Like it was not like a match that like you know we definitely didn't get two million YouTube hits. <laughs> Let me put it that way. You know it was like a way like it was a slow build of a thing. So in terms of how that's affected, I think you know the kind of stuff that I've been writing anyway, and that I'm what, what I think why people were interested in me in, in the states was because in the same way that like again I'm very sort of focused on like authenticity and performance. You know I also grew up like on Star Wars as much as I did like Michael Haneke, and like so the stuff I'm doing now is like there's like a, you know one. Like I'm doing a, a movie with um, with Michael DeLuca who did like The Social Network and that one is like a big supernatural thriller and I'm doing like a big kidnapping thriller and uh, there's, so there's a couple like larger projects like that but they're always still coming back to for me what I do best which I think is like really strong character driven work that just feels really authentic but then applying that to genre and finding ways to elevate genre. Okay, so let's break it down. What projects do you currently have that are looking viable at the moment? And did you originate the project, or did somebody else originate it and bring it to you? Is it coming through your agent? Are you like, what's the? It's honestly, it's all a mix. Like, I have a bit of, and again, this is why I say like there is, and it's really interesting for where I'm at right now, where I see like there's power in having material because I was developing a lot of material, and again, because of this beautiful city. I get, was able to get develop, telefilm development financing for several projects. So I've been amassing a mix of stuff that either I was getting development money to write or there was some scripts that I optioned and was then since rewriting. Um, because then coming to the States, it's like everybody's hungry for material. And like right now, like this was just the weirdest thing this past week. There was like four jobs that suddenly land, that started you know, coming towards me. And, could, did, uh, I'd just like to interject and say that um, uh, when we asked Jason if he could, um, or when we asked Ed if he could come here, he said, can we do a loop through L.A.? So the, the whole thing before the other. Well, yeah, because that was, I, I was in New York and then got a call. So anyway, there was like a couple of like big movies that uh, 
I'm, I'm up for. But what's so interesting is, and I've joked, like, for me, like, the distressed property is, like, the ideal thing for me. It's like, because the reality is, is, like, one of these movies, even though they really like my ideas, after the meeting, I'm like, they're going to go for, like, David Fincher or something. Like, there's, like, they like me and all, but, like, really, I just got the vibe that they're, the, the script's good enough that they can get somebody more famous. Whereas for me, the stuff that's been really interesting is when I'm working with great, like, you know, very famous producers that have a property that's a little broken, like, and, and they can't quite figure it out. There's been a couple of movies, like, there's one thing that I'm doing again with the Social Network guys and the guys that did Black Swan. So, like, there's, like, two, like, you know, major, major producers, um, um, uh, Phoenix and, and Michael DeLuca. And, but the project was flawed, but I guess, you know, for me, like, as, as someone who's a writer, I just had strong instincts of how to fix it, and they, like, loved my idea, so then that got us going on how to make the movie together. It, the reality is, if someone's so got a great... So that attaches you as writer and director to the yeah. project. Yeah, right. so, but I mean, but, like, you know, if, if someone's got a great script, it's gonna, they're gonna go, like, you know, David Fincher, blah, 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 and then eventually they'll hit, like, the bottom Hollywood guy, and then they'll find me, <laughs> like, um, <laughs> right? I mean, it's just, it's just business, right? I get it. But again, having material or having an ability to fix material or turn something, t turn like, you know, uh, a flawed material into something really interesting. It, um, that's been an exciting so process. So your agent, your agent now has a new hot property. You've got the variety buzz behind you. And you, um, they set up meetings with, with various producers. You go in, and sometimes these people are pitching projects to you. Are they, you're, you're thinking they're the, the broken projects that maybe you can... Well, like I mean, it's fix. a mix. Like, right now, like, there's a sequel that I'm up for of, like, a popular genre movie, but, like, I don't really think that's the next, is a smart move for me, even though I actually like the original. Like, just from a business perspective, I don't mm -hmm. think that's a strong strategic move for me to do a sequel, like, as my next movie. So, like, even, like, it's, we'll see if I, you know, but, uh, so, I mean, there are a couple of things like that where that particular project is because the producer has this very specific affinity for my film that, you know, they were one of the first people I met in L.A. back in, like, February, uh, like, just after the Palm Springs thing, and, um, or January, I guess that was, and uh, so that was, like, that's a specific instance where it, it's an interesting project, but, um, but m more, most, nine times out of ten, if someone's going to be sending me a script, it's, it's, like, you know, I'm either getting, like, a cattle call script, or I think, like, uh, or something that is interesting but flawed. Um, and when you go in and meet with these people, I mean, it's, it's not often that you get the, the um, emerging directors get, get the opportunity to meet with some of these people. When you go in, are you also pitching your projects to them? Well, that's, I mean, and that's typically what the main thing has been, is that people have really responded. Again, the power is that if you have material that people want, like, they will, you know, they can gravitate towards it. Because that's like the, you know, the, the, in, especially in the States, like where development money is actually your own money. And like when I got, you know, hired to write something, and even though the guy was busting my balls over the notes I was giving, I'm like, well, it is actually his own money. Like, you know I mean, this is like a guy writing me a check out of his own, you know, it's his company, it's like his money. So, like, it hits home in a different way than, like, when somehow it's, you know, you think, it, you know, it's a government agency or something like that. Like, but, it, and obviously there's still, you know, notes you have to do with, like, through telefilm, but, um, so uh, there is still just, but when you have material that you can offer them that they didn't actually have to pay for, like, that's, a really exciting thing like they want to and but for me strategically again like I'm not optioning any of my scripts like I'm not selling them because I that's as a means of securing me as director because a couple mm -hmm. of my things I, somebody I mean somebody might buy but you know an option fee like again for me with the director without like a Hollywood quote they might buy it for I don't know like five ten thousand dollars as an option mm -hmm. but then I have no control over it after that point they can hire another writer they can and it's just like I that for me would not that money wouldn't be meaningful enough for pro, especially if it's a project that I really like and care about like why would I it should be very short term thinking I think to take like the 10 grand when uh, as opposed to saying like great let's have like you know there's a million ways that the, the lawyers can do it like a shopping agreement or something like that or just or even in some cases like just a you know a verbal connection until they finance it but um, but it just as a means of having the power because if you control the material there is a power in that and then you can control the, you can keep yourself on as director. And are you still working with Lee? Here yeah, I mean, like, one of the movies, actually, the movie that I'm doing with, with uh, Mike DeLuca, uh, that we're... So, we're not Michael, it's now Mike DeLuca. Well, actually, funny, yeah, he just goes... <laughs> you know what, it's funny, I, I, the first time I heard, like, some people refer to, like, movie stars as, like, oh, like, I met Sandy Bullock, and I'm like, but that actually is apparently what she goes by, or, like, you know, like, Tony Hopkins, like, that's actually how they refer to him. So it's like, <laughs> on the one hand, you seem like something, you feel like some like, you're being a douchebag by dr calling them that, but that's actually just their name. It would be like, if you started referring to me as Edward, I'd be like, fuck off, it's Ed. Like, I'm like, what are you, my mom? Right? Like, um... But, uh, <laughs> but, like, that movie, for example, like, again, because I'm really trying to still maintain, there's a, there is a very much a power of having access to, like, the funding that we have here. And for me, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to, like, leave, I'm trying to just straddle the borders. So, like, that movie, even though it'll be American-financed, um, I'm trying to shoot it in Ontario and have Lee and I be the producers on the film, like, the Canadian, essentially the service producers, fundamentally, um, to that movie. 
And because again, like you know, just creatively, like leave somebody you know um, I want to continue working with, and we're also doing this rock gospel musical together. That um, you know, I, I think we'll probably you know that we're, is being developed by Telefilm, and so we'll probably finance that and shoot that still in Canada. But I, I'm also British as well, so do it as a European co-production, and maybe bring on like one of my American partners as like an exec producer. So it's just finding ways to like you know manipulate. So you're taking advantage of all the people who have interest in you and just taking it to the next level, which is very good, but still maintaining your roots. Yeah, I mean, because for me, it's just figuring out, like, what do I really want to do? And the, by being able to write um, or just sit down and, and figure out what you want to do, that for me is where you can actually control your own destiny. Because if I was just, if I was, good, like, my career was based on just what I'm being offered it just as a straight director, like, it would be a shitty path. Like, I would just, you know, it just, because there's so many people wanting to do it and, you know, um, until, it really, right now, it's like I've got attention. Now it's all the effort, or the attention is now really, it's on me then do, successfully pulling off this next larger budget right. film. And then it, it would be different because then like suddenly, okay, like, you know, then I'm, you know, I'm no longer down here in the list. I'm like, you know, I don't know, here. <laughs> um. <laughs> so now it's interesting to hear that you say that you've, one of your projects is a rock gospel musical uh, because one of the things that was really notable in your, in, in Small Town Murder Songs is, is your connection to music. I mean, there, was, there are certain scenes where, um, the music comes on and is completely dominating, so you get the image and the music, and you're not you're not getting other other elements. But it's just it's just exactly the right music. You clearly have a strong connection there. Rock rock gospel musical is just a a wild. Yeah, I never really, I don't really like musicals, um, and until I saw the movie once, and that movie changed, like made me think like ah like that's cause I, often for me again like trying to find like rooting stuff in character and authenticity. I have a hard time figuring out why people break into song. But if it's within the context of uh, people being singers, like that for me was a way, like I just loved, it was so like just that simple slow handheld push in on that guy. I remember I was like on a flight to Brazil and I was just like in tears. Like on this, I was like all, getting all choked up like watching the first five minutes of that movie and I'm like, why am I like crying over a busker? And it was just like, but it was just like such an emotional like rooted performance and just it was captured so simply. I just thought it was, so that, yeah, that made me get inspired about trying to figure out like what would my take on, on a musical be. Right. Um, let's talk a, a little bit um, about uh, Hope with a Shotgun and, and branding. Like, as a director, um, now that you've done something like that, and because it, it made such a hit straight out of the gate, um, are, are the discussions that you're having all about that as a style? Is that, does that, um, do you imagine that film as something that will <coughs> define you for a, long, for a career? Uh, probably, because it's the film that I wanted to make. It's, it's very reminiscent of the films I grew up making. Um, so, I... I I don't know, I, I hope to continue making some films like it, but it's mm -hmm. also a dream of mine to make a really cool kids movie. Uh, mm -hmm. Like a movie that could get, inspire kids to get away from their computers. You mean that wasn't a kids movie? <laughs> <laughs> it is actually, hopefully it's very much a kids movie. Like, although kids shouldn't see it, but <laughs> when, when I was making the movie, I really found myself like, when making decisions, I had always referred to like the 13 year old inside of me and I'm like, would you dig it boy? And if it's like, yeah, go for it. Then I'm like, all right. <laughs> so it's, it's a film for 13 year olds that, where they're supposed to sneak and watch. It's, like, you know? Well, I, like, I wouldn't like tell a kid or put a copy of, 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 uh, of Hobo in their hands, but I can re remember like being in elementary school and hearing kids coming back and talking about like, like the older kids in grade six talking about uh, seeing Terminator 2 and that their dad let them watch it and being like, oh man, I wish like I could see that. And then, you know, going to a friend's house and then watching it. And it was, it was a lot of fun to kind of like sneak around and try and see those movies. Well, one of the things that's um, nice about Hope with a Shotgun is that, uh, you know, despite the fact that it was an action film, there's lots of blood and guts and all that, the whole thing, and, um, and wild violence in it. Uh, it was very cool actually to see the, um, uh, how you used the, um, street, what do you call Oh, the manhole? The, the manhole, yeah. yeah, getting the head off. Yeah, well, the movie's very much like a Western. It's like this crazy cartoon Western. But he's actually so a good guy. The hobo, I mean, oh, yeah. it seems like... Well, it's, yeah, and it's also, yeah, he's like a, but it's also kind of like a tragic story where he kind of like <coughs> becomes this monster through his journey. Uh, but it, yeah, like for instance, I, like, I don't know, there was a lot, there's a lot of similarities between Westerns. Instead of like burying someone up to their neck in the sand, it was burying them up to their neck in a sewer. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, going forward, what have you got on the go right now? Um, I'm working on a couple things. I, I can't really like talk about the features that like I'm, I'm just like kind of trying to figure out what it is where our next step is going to be. But uh, I am working on this like short film project uh, called The ABCs of Death, 
and basically uh, the Alamo Draft House and Fantastic Fest have like gotten together to pick 26 uh, genre filmmakers from around the world to each like make a short, and we're given a letter from the alphabet, and uh, we have to come up with like a death that's associated with our letter, and then. Uh, and, and do it within like three to four minutes. Is like so, that like Edward Gorey book kind of? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And so like I'm, I'm shooting a short and I'm better. also going to use it to kind of help pitch my next... Of my course feature. you are. Yeah. Of course <laughs> you are. What, yeah, what letter did you get? I got an M. So yeah. Well, M is mean, in terms of death. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, yeah, I, I'm working on this thing. I, my dream project is to make this movie about a 12-point buck deer. And he's the main character on a rampage to like try and save his son, this little fawn from some it's hunters. It's a children's movie. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> Bambi with a shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm tr I'm trying to figure out a way to make that happen. I've like I pitched like I've done the whole like water bottle tour in L.A. And it, that was one of the pitches I would give them. It's like the main character is this 12 point buck deer and he doesn't say anything. And they're just like. <laughs> <laughs> but you, um, separate from that, did you get end up getting an agent and? Yeah, uh, I'm represented by uh, Jason Burdens from UTA. Right. Yeah. And has that um, meant that you've had a round of meetings and that? Kind of thing? Yeah, and getting scripts as well too. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay. Well, I think we will open it up for Q and A to the audience. Um, so, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please put up your hand. And okay, so one there, and then one down here. Anything at the back? Oh, apparently we, we now have a special giveaway, two complimentary gift certificates for the Gulf Islands Film and TV School to the first person to answer the following, sorry, I've just been handed this, um, the first person to answer the following questions correctly. Number one, who is the lead actor in Hobo with a Shotgun? <laughs> Hand up. Okay, hat. Rutger Howard. Rutger Howard, yes. Okay, you win a complimentary gift certificate for the Gulf Island Film and TV School. Um, question number two, who is the lead, act, lead female actor in Small Town Murder Songs? Down at the front, Jill Hennessy, correct. Um, thank you to the Gulf Island Film and TV Schools and interesting interlude there, thanks. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so um, questions from the audience. So we've got one microphone down here, go ahead. Um, Ed, you didn't go to film school, so how do you uh, think that affected the direction you're career went? Well, I mean, I guess I'm not the best person to ask I mean, in some ways, because I mean, like, you know, I never graduated university either, but, um, uh, you know, and I, 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 I left with one credit, uh, which ironically was an open elective, um, <laughs> undone. But, um, uh, I, I, you know, I guess, in, in, you know, obviously if I wanted to be a doctor, I'd be a pretty shitty doctor, but um, in film and, and, like, art, I think you can just, I, it's, it's more about, like, doing than it is about I mean, learn, I think I think you kind of like learn by watching movies. You learn by, but you really you learn by doing. And it is, I, I I don't know. I think with the tools available to people now, I mean, like you know, again, you can you can learn to edit. Quite, you know, you can download demos of any of any software, or, or mm -hmm. you know, there may not be one or two illegally downloaded programs on my computer. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, it didn't it didn't affect me, and certainly in any negative way. And I I just don't think. I mean, I think sometimes like. You know, it's funny, because I actually got turned down by the CFC uh, four times. Um, and then they, <laughs> then they started bringing me in to speak to their students. And, um, and, uh, Did you start by telling them that story? Well, I said, yeah, I said, I can't, and then, you know, I, I, I said, I'm not going to, like, you know, shit talk you guys, but I'm going to be honest that, like, you know, I don't necessarily uh, think, you know, this is the be all and a way to, to learn how to make movies, but, um, uh, so, so yeah, uh, I, I think really it, it, it just is about doing stuff, and I think the one problem sometimes with those with schools at times is it can sort of teach you to work in a way that doesn't actually exist when you're like right out of school. Like, I mean, you can learn how to work like on a Hollywood movie in some ways, but like, and you know, it's great in some ways, like the CFC thing where they, they give you like essentially like a hundred grand to make a short, and it's really like a calling card. But like your next short, like, I'm like, how, how do you go and then do it when you only have like a grand or like 120 bucks? Like, you know, and, and I think. I think there's something more interesting by, like, I really think, like, desperation leads to breeds innovation, mm -hmm. and I think the less sometimes by, you know, I, I have bemoaned so many times when I didn't get funding, and I've been like, you know, life's so hard, blah, 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 poor me, and, but I'm like, you know what, I've often, like, that in some ways is like, if, if you can't actually, you know, suck it up, and if you can't 
hack it, then it's maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> it's like it's a, it's it's a natural selection process that if you want it bad enough, and if you're willing to like fight for it, and then really figure out what's important to you, like that. If it's all just sort of frankly easy and just within a within a bubble kind of context, I don't know that you're really learning about like who you are and what you actually need to say and why and what is it worth like all this bloody work like that's because it's just a lot of work so um so you have to want it really really badly and just be relentless and go for it and go for it and go for it and just make stuff yeah i mean just and accept the fact that you know like you know don't let the fact that a ton of people say no stop you and just like you know um and or stop you from asking like you know you don't have i mean i think that can be a, you don't want to just sort of like you know become like an all you know stick your head in the sand and just do your own thing like i you know still keep shooting for other things and feel free to apply for money and be rejected and it's, it's still like it's just part of the, the so it's the your process. own film school but you also said earlier that um you watch michael haneke films as a big inspiration to you so obviously the there's, um, you're doing your own film school in a way by studying other filmmakers' work. Well, I just, I just watched a lot of movies. Like, I wasn't conscious, like, because I was doing theater then. I, it somehow, was, like, there seemed a disconnect. I either thought, and, and you know, that's just me being like a snobby theater director um, at the time. That, like, you know, either, either that like, I was going to end up that there, there was no sort of natural brink between like doing sort of like theater and somehow getting to the films. It was like you're going to do like crappy TV or something. Like that was the only thing that seems like, like, you know, or like you know, the idea of somehow that you're a sellout if you're doing something like that. But as opposed to actually just being a natural form of artistic expression. But that was really just out of an ignorant, again, me coming out of theater school kind of point of view. And, and I think it was largely based because, you know, especially because I was dating a lot of actors, um, you, know, you look at the material that sometimes actors are, like, to make their living, it's like, you know, sometimes they're auditioning, you know, for, you know, just the most horrible things. So I sort of had an idea that, like, the only way to direct movies would be to, like, to be doing film would be to, like, doing the kind of stuff that my, you know, girlfriends were auditioning for, which, you know, right. is horrible. Right. Okay, uh, there was another question. Somebody, who's got the microphone? Right Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Um, to both directors, um, since, uh, especially being self-taught, Ed, are there any specific techniques or exercises or things you did to practice teaching yourself the camera techniques? Um, I don't know. I guess, like, uh, for me, like, when I, when I got out of high school, I went to, like, a community college, and it cost, like, less than two grand a year. And I like more than made up for that tuition and just taking out all their gear like in one night. And so I just <laughs> use it like as an opportunity to take the gear out as much as possible. And it was like they just they taught us how to use the camera and how to do all the technical things. So I learned how to like camera operate, how to light, grip, gaff, how to do how to record sound, how to mix it, how to edit. And so I, I just learned how to use everything so that when I got out of that two year program, I could just go out and make a film for nothing on my own and just that's I, I pretty much just I kept I kept shooting everything that we we were doing. Uh, I think the only thing I haven't really been involved in shooting is the hobo with the shotgun feature film. I kind of gave it up to uh, my DOP, and uh, so I could just kind of concentrate on working on with the actors. But I think uh, like growing up using the camera a lot just really prepared me to know like where to like put a camera and how to like make the, when's the right times to like make the camera move. And uh, it just made it a lot easier for d directing my DOP and camera operator. It just um, I, I I get there. I know where I want the camera, what to what to do with it, and then they could just go ahead and work on that while I could spend the time working with actors. And I think I think you learn a lot by putting the camera in the wrong place. Um, I mean, it's true. Right? You you learn. I mean, you learn more by your mistakes than your yeah. successes. Like oh man, it really. You know, that was a. I was just trying to be smart, and that really sucked, right? Yeah. You know, you learn, like, and that's, so just from a technical perspective, by just doing, uh, it's not an intellectualization, it's actually, you can just see for yourself it works. But, I mean, the one thing that, like, I come back to, or I've come back to, like, twice now, and it's, it's just a great, great book, was, I mean, because I came to directing, at least for me, like, more from an editing perspective, I guess, in terms of how to put together a movie. And there's this great book called The Conversations that Michael Ondaatje wrote. And it's conversations with him and Walter Murch. And I read that when I was cutting the first shot that I cut entirely on my own, and it blew my mind. And, and then when I started cutting my first feature, I read it again. And I was amazed at how much, like, I, I, you know, I read that book again and just how much new things I got. It just was so inspiring. Just from like, getting into, like, the psychology of, like, what it means to cut, to make a cut, and how that just actually affects people on an emotional level to go from one shot to another and just really thinking about like why am I doing these things like what not just from like why am I making a movie in, a, in that kind of sense but like why cut from this to this or like why not stay in this shot and hold it and have it create a, ten, like, a sense of tension and learning that by holding a shot you actually can maintain tension longer and 
And it, Walter March is just great. Like he did, like you know, Apocalypse Now, one, of, two of the Godfather movies. And he play, plus he's like a major. He's interesting because he's both an editor, picture editor, and sound editor and, and mixer. But um, and yeah, for me the coolest thing was actually watching my first movie was then because um, I stole this number phone number from my dad's theater. Was uh, I, I got Michael Andachi to come and sit in my living room and watch the movie that like I had been so inspired by his books. So I'm like talking to him about the editing, and that was like. Like one of those like such That's awesome cool. like full circle uh, moments, but mm. but yeah, I mean that for me is like that book is like you know a thirty dollar film school in some ways because it's it's less about technique and more about like I don't know just like art and how you can use film to to uh, as, as a tool to express yourself and, and just really analyzing what it, it 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 means and what it can accomplish. Um, other questions? Uh, any questions up top? Well, go ahead. Um, so one there and then one over there. You're next. No, wait. You're next. This gentleman's going first. Go ahead. Just really quickly, uh, Ed, how are you going about choosing your DPs on these projects you have coming up? Um, for the future ones, I mean, like, uh, I, re I mean, Brendan Stacy, who shot Small Town, um, I want him to do uh, Lavender, which is the one I'm doing with with DeLuca. Um, beyond that, I mean, I'm sort of, it, it, it'll depend on, again, where we shoot them as well. Like, I, I've i always sort of said, you know, I mean, like, I joke, like, like with Lee, my producing partner, that, you know, we have a non-monogamous relationship. So, I mean, and I kind of feel that way. I, I'm like, you know, you don't marry the first girl you date, so I wouldn't, like, commit to the first DOP I work with either. So, you know, I've really worked with, like, you know, a couple so far. And I'm, I'm interested, on the one hand, to still maintain those relationships, because there's, there is something really useful and important about having a short of hand with people and just people that you know and trust creatively and, and also that trust you and like so when you, you ask for something that they disagree with they'll at least have a positive dialogue with you about it. Mm -hmm. But that said I'm really open to like you know working with other people and, and there's so many DPs whose work I love and respect that I'd love the chance to just uh, to, 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 you know spread out too and so it, it really will at least well, you know for sure at least one of them is going to be Brendan and then beyond that it'll just depend on what movie we do where. Go ahead. So this question is about writing, and um, I direct and uh, produce, but um, I wouldn't consider myself a writer. But then I realize, the more I do this, how important it is to be a writer, right? And how important it is for a director to write their own things, um, for many reasons. Um, so, you know, I just want to pass the mic to you guys and give me your opinion about that. Um. I guess, I don't know, for me, with my experience, it's just been, I don't know, like making a feature film is such an emotional roller coaster, and it's like writing it, like, and being part of, like, creating the character just gives you that, I don't know, just that inner love for it in a different way that, like, you're going to spend, I don't know, like, when we were making Hobo, I was getting maybe, like, two hours a night of sleep, and so it just, like, that's, you you need to be in love with it. You have to be willing to, like, die for it in a weird way, honestly. And so by being, like, that close with it and that it's coming from you, it's, uh, it makes it a lot more easier for you to do it without any sleep. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I, I guess I'll slightly take back in a way what I said about having to, you know, in terms of, like, that there's a power just in being the writer, it's at least controlling the material. So, I mean, if you're a producer and a director, and you've got, like, a great writer you work with, then it's, like, at least if you control the material, you could go in and say, like, you know, find people to search for finance, but it's still, again, having you attached and, and, and to direct, as opposed to what I, you know, for me, it's more, if you're just a director, that is not a career path. It's not for me than being an actor. It's, like, as much as I think they're great, like, it's not a career path I envy, because you're not, I, I does, it's very hard, especially starting out to be in control of your own destiny as an actor, <coughs> Because just tr you, in some ways you just want to get a chance. So at least with the director, you know, you can make your own. You can write it. You can just take a camera, go make something. I, you know, I could never. I can't just be a, a waiter. Like I can't. <laughs> for both sense of the words, I couldn't be a waiter as a career, and I can't just sit stand waiting. So, um, but uh, like, so I, I, it's a very different um, position to be in. So I, I think you know it, if you've got stuff that you're developing or like a book that you bought, or a script that you bought that you really are passionate about, you just have just as much power as a writer who's, or as a director who also writes, I mean. 
Presumably, I mean, the other thing is that there are a lot of people who are actually extremely talented writers, but directing is not their thing. They're not that good at working with people. And equally with directors, there are some people who are really good with people, but they just can't put it on the page. Well, and just so, because I direct, direct, write, edit, produce doesn't mean I actually should. <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> like, I'm not necessarily, you know, I can't do all of those jobs well. Like, I usually start dropping the ball on something. What's your biggest strength out of the three? I don't know. I mean, honestly, probably directing. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, I would say that. Um, I, I actually am very, I, it's very hard for me to sit down and actually focus as writer or editor. Like, I can't, I'm a little ADD in that way. Like, that's, I think, why I'm working on so many things. I'll spend, like, two days on one, hop to the next, and, like, leapfrog like that. Like, for me to sit, like, I've had the days where I've done 12 hours at the edit suite, but, like, normally, I mean, honestly, I'm fucking on Facebook. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, you know, it's true, I'm at a, you know, unless, like, you were to seal me in a fucking vault, you know, like, with nothing but, I'd still be playing, like, solitaire then, like, you know, like, I actually do, I've been playing, so Spider Solitaire has prevented me from being productive on the last rewrite I was hired to do, because I've just been, like, I, part of me, I, I get squirmish about, like, oh, it seems like too much work, and, like, I just get wiggy about it, and I play sp Spy Solitaire. <laughs> So Jason, for you, you, you work with your, um, your writing, writing mm -hmm. partner, um, and do you entertain the idea of having other scripts come to you that you would just direct? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh. But I still, like, I've been offered a lot of things, and it really has to, I really got to connect on it, to it. I'm not and just going to jump anything? on something. Um, yeah, there's a couple things, although I'm asking for some rewrites. <laughs> But, uh, and are you doing the rewrite, um, you and your partner yourself? Or, or? It's possible. Right. I'm kind of in the, in the process of trying to figure that out. But it's just, yeah, I have to, like, love it. I can't, I honestly just can't do something for the money. Like, I, I'll, I, all I need really is just enough money to pay my rent and feed my cat, and I'll be happy. And uh, it doesn't take that much to do that. And I need to, uh, like, absolutely love and be passionate about what I'm doing. So it's a... Uh, I'm sure my agent gets very frustrated with me. <laughs> so, uh, I, I turn down a lot. Any other questions? Question at the back? The, we need you to um, do it into the microphone just because we're recording as well. Yes, of course. Uh, just uh, both of your movies contain uh, pretty much a lot of violent, which is Canadian cinema wasn't well known for in the past years. Do you think it's a necessary component to be successful in the marketplace? Mm, I don't think so. I, although, a lot of the films I love from Canada come from the tax shelter days in the 70s and 80s and had a lot of violence in them. Uh, but, I don't know. I just, I, I guess, uh, I, I am interested. I love action, and uh, I've always been drawn to action just from, I guess it just comes from a lot of just growing up in the 80s as a kid playing with action figures and watching 80s cartoons. It's just like, it's uh, ingrained in me, so... I mean, uh, there's actually very, not very much violence in my film. There's more the tension. You're feeling there's a constant tension or threat of violence, and it's that being sort of stretched out over the film. Um, but, uh, of course, yeah, any bit of that you stick in the trailer just to make it, you know, <laughs> look. <laughs> you know, but, um, no, I mean, I, mean, I don't my, my other films, I mean, there is, I mean, one of them is like a very violent modern noir western. Um, you know, there's no violence in my musical. Um, <laughs> But you also, I mean, with, with both of you, presumably there are other filmmakers whose work you, you like very much. It's kid, I mean, you said you like kids' films, so yeah. there's room, room for that as well. I think, I mean, one of the things with the session when we were talking about success stories, um, the, the, the underlying theme was not make violent films, certainly not. It was, you know, be, um, go out there and just make your film any way you can, be inventive. If there's a, a trailer competition, you've got 120 bucks in your pocket, put, throw your hat in the ring and see what happens from there. And if opportunities come up, carpe diem. You know, it's that kind of thing. And also, it, um, in, in the case of Ed, it's, uh, you know, it's building on sort of, you know, whatever um, opportunities you have in terms of relationships with actors and, and skipping film school and borrowing, borrowing money yourself so that you can go out and um, finance your own work. It's, that's really the underlying idea. It's, it's not about... Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, content in, in each of the films in terms of violence. And I, and I also have to say, like, with Ed's film, I, I'm assuming that you haven't seen Ed's film, otherwise you probably wouldn't have made that comment, because it, it really is very much a character story. And in, in your film, it's like, it's in Canada, to take a, um, a for a, an emerging director to make that kind of an impact in the market. And genre films, like, 
you know, I, I mean, I, I program at film festivals. I'm, I'm looking at international cinema, but it's like I totally hats off to, to um, both of you guys. I mean, with Jason, it's like I think it's an amazing thing to be a, um, a Canadian who's made that much of an impact in the, um, around the world and have people now coming to him. I think it's a fantastic thing. So on that note, thank you both so much for, for being here. Thank you.